Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is our first video in a series of videos on the epithelial tissues. We will focus in this video on how we separate the epithelial tissues into those that form glands and those that are responsible for the lining and the covering of organs in our body. And then we'll also look at some common functions of a number of the epithelial tissues. After this video, I will then introduce you to the general characteristics of epithelial tissues, which is then followed by a discussion on all the different groups of epithelial tissues. And then finally, there will be a video on the epithelial glands. Epithelial tissues, as you'll see, are often also referred to as the epithelia, a Latin way of referring to them. You'll see books do that quite often. So we have two kinds of epithelial tissues. One, one type is referred to as glandular. Basically, every gland in your body is made up of epithelial tissue. So every gland in the body is made up of some kind of epithelial tissue. Now, aside from forming glands, our epithelial tissues are also responsible for covering and lining organs. So let's take a look at what this really means. So let's say that we cut through a hollow organ. So our organ might be looking like this, right? Um, this could be a blood vessel, this could be the intestine, uh, it could be the, um, the stomach, the uterus. It doesn't really matter, so I'm not the best artist here, but basically we're looking at a hollow organ and we're now going to make a cross section. So we slice through it like so, and we're looking at it heads on, okay? And so that brings us then to this figure here. So the cavity of any hollow organ we're going to refer to from now on as the lumen. So if we were looking at a cross section of a blood vessel, this is where the blood would be. If this were the stomach, this would be where the food would be. If this were the uterus, this would be where the baby is growing. If this were the bladder, this would be where the, the urine is, etc., etc. And so every hollow organ has a lumen, and every lumen of every hollow organ will always be lined, as we say, by epithelial tissue. So in other words, the very first layer that literally is in contact with the contents of the lumen is always going to be epithelial tissue. So this green layer is epithelial tissue. And we express this as the lining of the lumen. But we also see that organs are going to be protected and covered by epithelial tissue. And so this layer here, this covering, I can also label as epithelial tissue. So now you understand the difference between covering and lining. Epithelial tissues are, are very common tissues in the body, uh, not as widespread as the connective tissues, uh, but still certainly very, very common. And they come with all kinds of functions, and by no means have I listed every single function here, uh, but the majority of them are listed here. And so let's go over these so that you have a better understanding of what they mean, because um, I suggest that you complete some kind of a chart to keep all these epithelial tissues organized, not just what they look like and their descriptions, but um, you know, a list of their major functions and also uh, very specific locations, examples of locations, I should say. So epithelial tissues protect, and that's pretty obvious, particularly since we just looked at, at that diagram on the previous slide that shows that epithelial tissues cover organs. Now, you know, so far I've talked mostly about hollow organs, um, but we even see 
that um, other organs are going to be covered with epithelial tissue, and in particular, I'd like to address our skin. Our skin is an organ. It's made up of epithelial tissue as well as connective tissue, as we will soon learn once we're done studying histology. And it is obviously not a hollow organ. But when I scratch the surface of my hand gently, I am literally scratching the superficial epithelial tissue layer of my skin, uh, which is a layer you might have heard that term called the epidermis. And clearly the epidermis protects us. Epithelial tissue might also be involved in filtration. And we see this, for instance, in the case of the kidneys. Um, where, uh, well, let's, let's more, more specifically define on the term filtration. So first of all, it's a passive process. And it depends, meaning it does not require ATP, right? And it depends on a pressure gradient. So we're not talking here about a concentration gradient, but a pressure gradient. So it's, it's very similar. We can compare pressure gradient to concentration gradient. So if we're looking at a concentration gradient, you would always compare two environments, concentrations, right? So if there's a cell A with a bunch of proteins inside, and this is cell B with a bunch of proteins inside, then clearly cell A has a higher um, concentration of proteins than B, right? And so we say that there is a gradient across these two cells, a concentration gradient. And we can say the same thing for two different environments or even two different cells uh, that they, when they that if they express a different pressure, we talk about them having a pressure gradient, and this plays a very important role. For instance, in our kidneys, when our blood is going to be uh, filtered, and so blood enters in these tiny little capillaries in our kidneys, and because the blood is going to enter under a higher pressure than its surroundings, the blood plasma is literally pushed through the cell membranes of the cells that make up the wall of these tiny little blood vessels. And so this brings up uh, another thing to mention that is part of filtration, and that is the presence of a filtration membrane. And so what is our filtration membrane here? In my example, it basically is the wall of the blood vessel and also the wall of the, the, the basically the, 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 the structure that I'll just draw like this. I'm really being sketchy here. That collects um, the plasma that's being filtered. So this would be our filtrate, therefore. So the pressure would be higher here than the pressure here. And that creates that pressure gradient. So this is how our blood is filtered in our kidneys, and that filtrate will ultimately, after some manipulation in our kidneys, become the urine that you and I excrete. So that brings up our last term here. Um, and why not just go ahead and jump to it, since uh, I, use, I just used it. So notice that in the term excretion, you see X um, as its prefix. So this is... Um, a form of removing wastes, removing substances from the body. So literally, substances leave or exit the body. That's how I think of it. So when uh, we have a bowel movement, when we urinate, but even when we sweat, we can argue that we are excreting. Now, interestingly enough, we can also say that when we sweat, that the sweat is secreted. So secretion usually means that substances are, are I'm going to just say, dumped into a duct of some sort, or the blood or lymph. In other words, notice the difference between 
excretion and sub su secretion. In excretion, we see that these substances have to exit the body, and that is not going to be the case in the case of secretion. There we see that the substances stay within the body, uh, either being entered into a duct or the blood or the lymph. Um, and there could be even other substances that might um, receive secretions, as you'll learn more about later. So when we say that sweat is secreted, it means that it's secreted in ducts. And these ducts will then lead to the surface of our skin, and there it can exit the body or be excreted. So the final term that I need to address here is absorption. And since I'm kind of running out of space here, I'll just rewrite it here, which is a term that you're going to see over and over again in anatomy and physiology, and it's an important term for you to remember. So let's say we try to visualize what is meant by the absorption of nutrients. Well, that refers to the movement, let's just say absorption of nutrients, to, to just give you an example that you can relate to better. That would refer to the movement of the nutrients that we have ingested from our small intestine, I'm using abbreviations, into our blood. All right, and where is that blood going to be located? Well, that's going to be located in the wall of the small intestine. Oops, small intestine. And of course, where are the nutrients located? They are located in the lumen of the small intestine. Okay. With time, you learn about more examples of absorption. But for now, uh, it'd be good if you could remember what we really mean by the movement, by the absorption of nutrients. So the definition of absorption of nutrients is not digesting. Per se, it's not taking in, taking in what and where does it go, right? So be sure that you're specific. Uh, another word of caution about defining terminology, whether it's my class or in the future, is that you can't use a version of the new term in your definition, right? For instance, um, I'm a foreigner, English is my third language, let's say I were to ask a person, you know, define for me absorption. I don't understand what that word means. Um, you know, that person could say to me, well, it's to absorb stuff. Well, I don't know what that means to absorb, right? So uh, be careful with giving definitions that you always use different terms than the actual terminology. Okay, so this wraps up our um, introduction to the epithelial tissues. And we're going to next take a look at the major characteristics of the epithelial tissues.